in the water. God's gonna trouble the waters. I say, wait in the water. Why don't you wait in the water, children? Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Well, hello. hello. I'm Dave, and I'm a slave. I was born in 1801 in Edgefield, South Carolina, on a plantation they called Potterfield. Mr. Harvey Drake was the master. I never knew my mother. I never knew my father. I was raised by Granny. She had a whole bunch of, they called us pickaninnies. And we just ran around and ate out of a trough, and we were like little savages, you know. But when I got to be five, they were over there digging clay out the ground. I just loved what they were doing. And they would bring this clay back and put it in this big hole, and they had spokes. And a mule just went round and round and round and, and got it wet. And then they would push a lever, and the clay would squirt out the end. And they said, Dave, you're, you're a ball boy. So your job is to make these big balls and take them to the people at the wheel. So I did that for a while, and it was, it was a lot of fun to me. I'm about five or six years old. So that went on for a long while, I guess about 12, 13. Finally, a couple things happened. Mr. Drake taught us to read and write. He was very religious. He thought that it was, if slaves would learn to read and write the Bible, they would be a better slave. Wasn't exactly true, but anyway, I learned to read and write. Around about 11, he came to me and said, Dave, you want to get on that wheel? I said, yes, yes. So they taught me how to get on the wheel. Over a period of time, I got better and better. Now I'm 17. Now, pottery back in those days was the key thing. It was a cash crop, and I was a cash player. They had itinerant potters to come, and they paid them by each piece. I became so good, so fast, so skilled, that they let them go. Funny thing, some of the people at the plantation didn't know I could read and write. They would tell me every day, what to make. Finally, they started leaving notes for me. <laughs> I could read and write. So I started to do this. It was really, really fun, but remember, I'm a slave. Nothing that I do is ever rewarding to me. I'm working for someone else. The reading and writing took me from the darkness of slavery. Slavery is designed that you do not know anything that's going on in the world. While I was working at the plantation, Dr. Landrum wanted me to come down and work at the, the hive. It's a thing called the Edgefield Hive. It's a newspaper. And he taught me how to set type. Now, a lot of stuff was going on. Dr. Landrum was a nullifier. Anybody know what that is? The nullifiers were the people that did not want the South to succeed from the North, because he wasn't too popular with that. But anyway, I would hear discussions in there. He had about five or six men in the back room. I heard about volcano in Italy. I heard about trouble in Germany. I heard about wars and uh, I heard about all kinds, and I learned big words like extractivism and, and other words. I learned these words and I had a dictionary that I would go back to my place with a little cave like or something and learn how to say that word and speak that word. Now, over time, Mr. Drake died and they sold me to Mr. Miles. And in with, between that time, they gave me away as a wedding present. One of the girls got married, I don't know which one it was, 
And I didn't get to go there, but I, that she took my income as her dowry. So Mr. Mr. Miles has me now. And now it's about 30 years later. And as a slave, I began to think of who I was. But I was also, I read about art in different places, and I realized I was an artist. So I started to write poetry on my punch. I knew how to read, I knew how to write, I could reason. So I started how to do that. And one of the great advantages that there were newspapers there in the hive, and I would read them and know what was going on in the world. So I was the cash crop. I was the one making all the money. If anyone come there to get a job, they said, no, we got Dave. So I worked pretty hard. Now that's enough talking. Let me get on that wheel. So that's what you guys came to see. You want to see that boy and make that wheel? Let, let me tell you about the, the, the fun part of the life was when we fired the wood kill. Oh, God. That was the most fun. People would come for miles around to see that thing. I helped stack the wood. I, I helped load the pot. I helped do everything until I got to be on the wheel. And that thing would bring people, the, the, the couples would be caught, the little kids running around, bellowing smoke out the kill, making noises, and that thing was red hot. You'd be looking in it. Be so wonderful. But the real thing was when they opened it up, see what was there. That was the real, real good part of mine. So let's do some wedging here. Yeah. Now this clay comes out, gotta wedge it up a little bit. And here, here go one of my things that I used to say, still say it today. I belong to Mr. Miles, where the oven bakes and the pot bows. Give me silver, give me gold, but they not good for your soul. Could I show anger? What you think? No. No. No, you couldn't show anger. You had to stuff it, because if you showed anger, you, you could get hurt. So what would they do for me? They'd give me a little extra food. I might get a new pair of shoes. But basically, I worked. I stayed at that wheel. I stayed at that wheel. Now, Miss Sally, she came by yesterday, and she wanted a, she wanted a pitcher for her buttermilk. So I made the pitcher yesterday. So today, I'm going to show you how to, how to make the handle. And the handles. You gotta get skilled to make a handle. I mean, handles are really fun, but you gotta know how to do it, how to stick them on. That's a little dry, but I think I can still make it. I'll just slap a little water on it. So let's make this handle. Now, anyone ever milked a cow? You, you know what I'm getting ready to do. There we go, we make this handle. Yeah, you gotta pull it down. And a, a potter that learns how to make handles, he can make two or three hundred a day. Yeah. There we go. We make that handle. We make it long. Yeah. Long handle. And then we tie it off. And you always make at least two because you never know if that one's going to work or not. So you make another one. One of the things that really got me was the fact that when they would open that kill and those pots would come out, people would come to buy them right away. They weren't even, they weren't even cold. They were buying those pots right away. But I would stay at that wheel and make those pots. And then later on, oh gosh, this is, I guess the 1840s, 1850. Westward expansion started. People wanted to go out west because they was going to give them land. That's when they sold my wife. 
Liddy and my child and took him away. That's where this poem came from. Where's all my friend and relation? Kinship of all in every nation. That's where it came from. They took my wife, took her away. Took her out west. So let's make some pots here. One of the key things that I learned about doing this was the fact that I started writing, I started knowing, because I used to see pottery shards all around the, the yard. And I'd ask, how old were these? And they couldn't tell me. They'd been there a long, long, long time. And so I started to think, if I write on that, it'll outlive me. And someone will know who I was and who I am as a person. So I started doing that. Somebody in front might get splashed, but that's okay. <laughs> that's a good thing. I, I, I tell people when they come to see me, I say, I know about the Catholic Church. They, they throw water on you, uh, holy water, right? <laughs> so if, they throw, if this gets on you, it's holy too, right? Okay, that's the way, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. So let's, let's make something. All right, so we get this wheel going. Now, I think when I first started making pottery, it took me five years to get good enough that they accepted something that I made. Everything I made went back in the slop bucket. But then one day, I think, in fact, I'm going to show you what I made. I made a bowl. One of the, one of the, the ladies came down to the, to the shop and said, Dave, I want a bowl for my cherries. I never knew what a cherry bowl would look like. But, you know, I just made a basic bowl. But, but she said, okay, make me a bowl and make it this wide, you know, like that. So I sat down there. I made that bowl. It takes you five years to learn how to manipulate this clay. But then I had a revelation one day. I'm making the clay. Who's making me? God's making me. This is the nastiest, dirtiest mess. If it gets wet, it gets all over you. Track it all over your house, get all in your clothes. The wagon gets stuck. But man, when you get a nice piece come out of that kill, it's beautiful. Because one of the things I loved about the kill was the fact that they had these glazes that they got from, uh, I think from China. They, 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 they learned about glazes from China. And, and this was so nice because I think it was the, the Sung Dynasty. And they had uh, creek settlings, ashes, and, 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 and uh, some kind of kaolin. And they would, they would make uh, this glaze. And the creek settlings were, were the stuff that's in the creek that settled. And the ashes would be from the wood stove. And then they would get broken glass and they would get the broken glass and they would do it. Now, so she said, make, make it nice. So, so it's going to a lady, right? So, so you gotta do this. You gotta do this. You gotta put a little indentation or something like that, you know. So she'll come to the studio. After this gets fired in the kill, she'll come and get it. And she'll like it. I won't get it outside. Maybe she'll give me a piece of barbecue or something. I don't know, but I'll do something with it. But there it is, see? All right, let's make something else. Now, now another thing about being a slave that I, I realized, even though I was a slave, I was a special slave. I was a slave that provided income for the whole plantation, all of them. They didn't put anyone else on the wheel but me. So I worked from, the expression is, I worked from can to can't. You know, when it got, when it got, the sun came up, I'm down there. When the sun goes down, I'm there. Now when did I eat? Well, 
you, 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 better, you better make sure you got to the eating time when it's time. Because most of the time, if you didn't, I didn't have time to have my own garden. I didn't have time to uh, go hunt. I didn't have time to go fishing because I had to stay at the wheel to make the pottery. So, you know, dinner time was very important. So I was dependent upon the people that owned me to provide what I needed, the clothing, the food, the shelter, the, the any extras that they would they would throw my way. They didn't, they didn't want to spoil. They didn't want to spoil the niggas. That's what they said. I didn't want to spoil the niggas, you know. But we keep them at that wheel. They treated me pretty good. And the reason why they treated me, because I spoke the king's English. I knew words. I could tell them what they were saying. I could listen to them and knew what they were talking about. But that's the, that's the disadvantage of slavery. People don't want the slave to know anything. The only thing they want them to know is the work from can to can. So I did that. And when my wife was gone and my son was gone, I went into a, a deep funk, a depression as it were. Now I told you that they taught me how to read and write and, and doctor told me how to set type. But I forgot to tell you that during that time in South Carolina, there was a there was a slave rebellion. There was two or three. Nat Turner, Denmark Vassy, and it was a stolen rebellion too. They said slaves are docile. They, they never fight back. That's not so. There was one, one thing that they really didn't want us to know about. The Haitian Revolution. I found that out down at the, the newspaper office. Where the Haitian people, the slaves, rose up and beat the French. They had guerrilla tactics, when I learned that word. They had weapons. They, they learned how to, to fight, and they won their freedom. Well, also, during this time, it was a capital offense to teach a slave to read and write. They, you could be killed or put in jail for six months or whatever, or fined. But they taught me anyway, thinking it would make me a better slave. I'm not still the jury's out on that. I'm not sure about that. But I learned how to read and write, and, and because of uh, the revolutions, they didn't want you to read and write. So I think about 1834 to about 1858 is my period where I made big jugs and I wrote on them. But there was a period there, it's called the silent period, where I, I stopped writing because I thought they were going to kill me. I thought they were going to get me. So I'm still making pots. My wife is gone, so is my kid. I'm learning more and more about what it means to be an artist, what it means to be a slave. How do you feel about yourself? I even heard about something, I'm not even sure where I heard it, but there was a guy in, I think it was in France, they was, his name was Fraud. You know, he was a person that worked with people's minds. And he was saying about the individual being greater than, you know, the sum of everything. And I, and I started to ponder that. This is one of the tricks that I always do. I always put that double line on my pots. Then I would sign them too. I'm not gonna sign this. So this is just a little face or something. I'm not sure why they're gonna use it, but, you know, just why to make it. And then and then I started, you know, when you become a potter, when you become an artist, you want to, you just don't want to make the same thing over and over again in the same way. So I do I started doing this. Started putting the decorations on it, you know. Of course, I'm not going to get a dime for it, but that's OK. I want my work to look good. I want my work to reflect who I am. I am Dave. I'm a slave, but I'm Dave. I want you to see what I do. I want you to know. All right, we got this one done. So let's get this one here.
Look at that. Somebody will know. Somebody will know. Now, we'll do another one here. So my people's gone. I did have friends in, in, the, in the pottery, but I'm the worker, you know. I'm the main one, so I have to keep at it and keep working. Keep realizing that I need to do what I got to do and keep on doing it. Okay, so let's make, let's make a big one now. Now the jugs that I made, they were huge. So what I had to do was throw so much, then throw another piece and make it together, and then keep on building it up. They weighed about 30 pounds, maybe more. Took two or three people to get them in the, in the pottery field. But I became the one who, who mastered that technique. And that's not splatter nobody, but hey. That's one of the unforgiving things about clay. The clay will not center itself. But then I found out that you have to center yourself before you can center the clay. I can't let the problems in the plantation bother me so much. I can't let the fact that I have my wife or child there, I can't let anything bother me because I want to do good work. I want my work to last. I want my work to, to be seen by everybody. And so I did the best I could with my work. So as I, as I lift this up, I'm lifting up my ancestors, of whom I am one. I'm lifting up the people that were born here in chains. I'm lifting them up because when the boat left Africa, the sharks followed the boat. It was 500 people on there that close together. Five miles off the shore, they start throwing bodies overboard. 20 miles off the sea sometime, off the coast, they would bring them up on shore, they would bring them up on deck, rather, to uh, exercise them. They would jump in the water. 20 people chained together. One would jump in and pull the rest of them in. They would kill. I am a survivor of those who, who came here and survived the Middle Passage. So everything I did, everything I did as, as a potter, working with Mr. Miles, is to remember those people of who I am one. So we make a big joke here. We make a big joke here. Now one of the things I learned, it looks like it's not right, but see, you got to keep going. You can't stop. Just keep going and you can, you can fix that. You can fix that. Just like you try to fix yourself, you can fix that. The rim is uneven, that's okay. Keep going, keep going. You're gonna add more to this one. Yeah, gonna add more to it. I never sang much, but they did have church sometime. A white minister would come there and try to teach us how to be better slaves. And I remember as a young man, I was about 20, I laughed at them over there crying and snotting and going on. And now at my age now, I'm the one snotting and crying, hearing them old songs about freedom, about down by the riverside, I'm gonna lay down my burden. I heard all those songs and, and they became they became real to me. You know, like that, that song that I, I sang coming in about wading the water. There's another song called Follow the Drinking Gourd. When, the, when the, they were trying to run away, they tell them, follow the drinking gourd. There was a star in the sky that looked like a drinking gourd. We follow it. That's how you get to freedom. I was always looking for a way to get, get out of there. I was always looking for a way to get free but I had to stay to this wheel. I had to stay to the wheel. And the main thing that I learned to do, 
to take care of myself as best I could and be true to my craft, which is pottery. Clay is not forgiving sometimes. If you don't know what you're doing, Clay will tell you you're not doing it right. So this is going to have a lid in it here and two handles. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that right now because I've got to make it today, fix it tomorrow. Look, yeah, stop this thing. And this is where I really started to know who I was when I did this. Cursor. Look at that. I can read. I can write. I am somebody. So I, that, that really made me happy. So Dave is getting ready to go now. I hear the dinner bell. I got to go. Because if I, if I don't go, I might miss it. But I sang that old song that I just love. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be resting in my grave. And I'll go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I stay a slave, I'll be resting in my grave. And go home to my Lord and be free. Say goodbye to Dave. He's gone now. You gotta hear about Jim now. Okay. I was born in 1945, so I'm old. <laughs> the kids don't understand. I'm old, but I but I still can do stuff. Now, you know how when you're old, they tell stories about you when you were young. How did Jimmy first start clay? Well, he was in the sandbox playing with a substance that he thought was clay and had a smell to it. He loved it. He's been doing it ever since. <laughs> now, I grew up in D.C. Well, I was born in Virginia, Norfolk. My dad was in the Navy. And him and my mom, he, he married the beauty queen in Norfolk. And they had three kids in quick succession, and the marriage didn't last. So my dad got custody of the children put us on a Goonie Bird, that old plane at DC-3, and flew us to DC from Virginia. And I'll never forget that. And so he, he met a lady who said, oh, I'll take you in. So we had a, I had a stormy childhood. I always thought that I was retarded. They didn't test for hearing when I was in school. So I went to school. I was all the way in high school. And Miss Williams was in the history class. She, she, she was up there going, I couldn't hear her. So I hooked her class the whole year. And come time to graduate, Jimmy don't have enough credits. So my dad said, you're going to summer school. I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, you grown. you got to get out. I joined the job corps, and I said, send me as far away from D.C. as possible. They sent me to Breckenridge, Kentucky. It used to be an Army base in World War II. And uh, when I got there, it was just at the, the cusp of segregation being ended, and you could go in the front door instead of the back door. Well, the people in in the town, Morgan Field was still going in the back door, and I was going in the front door. And, and so what happened was the white people that were there said that I was not black. I grew up, I'm black. Maybe I'm light-skinned, but I'm black. And they said, you don't act like the rest of them. I grew up in D.C. I knew how to go to restaurants. My father, had, my father was an artist. He bought people. We had different artists and people coming to the house, ate all kinds of food. But the pottery was really what I wanted to do. So at 27, this is really crazy. Well, I grew up in this period, and those, those, the guys who understand, you know, the war stories, the war movies. I wanted to be John Wayne. You know, John Wayne threw one grenade and 20 people died, you know. I wanted to do that. So I volunteered for Vietnam. I volunteered. You know, how crazy could that be? But there's a God. Guess what he said? 
He sent me to Germany. <laughs> so I'm in Germany, and my, my wife, she's my ex-wife, she, she didn't come with me. But So everybody was coming back from, Jer from uh, Vietnam. They smoked dope. They did cocaine. They did all kinds of crazy things. And I'm in the barracks with these guys. And I, I never grew up with this stuff. I never, I never drank. I never smoked. I'm scared to death of needles. I, I didn't take the paper home when the polio shots was coming out. My dad said, you're going to get all the shots in one day, two here and one in there. <laughs> and you better not cry either. Anyway, so I went to the craft shop, and I'm working in the craft shop. And the guy, Al Wurtz, he said, you, you like working with people? I said, yeah. So I learned how to do leatherworking, woodworking. I learned how to do everything. They had a, they had a pottery wheel over there, one of the kick wheels. Nobody knew how to use it. They couldn't teach me. So one Saturday morning, I got on the bus, and I went to, um, I was living in Ansbach. I went to Nuremberg. And, and, and I was walking down the street, and I saw, there's a pottery studio. And I went in there, and I pantomimed. And they said nine. I knew nine meant no. They gave me three no's, and finally somebody comes out the back room with a broom. I said, oh, God, these people are racist. <laughs> but I heard my father say, if you want to learn it, you'll do it. So three Saturdays in a row, I swept the shop. I did a good job. I got on them. Everything. I whipped it good. And um, finally, the fourth third that came, they were out back firing a kill, a wood kill. They said, you know, so I started learning a little German. V. Heisen, Z. Ich Heisen, McDowell, and thank you. I learned a whole bunch of words so I could communicate with them. But they realized I was a GI. And their eyes lit up. Those of you who are in, who's in the service, you know what's called a rash. I got a ration every month for cigarettes and booze. You know that. <laughs> three bottles of Jim Beam, three cartons of cigarettes. They would have gave me their mother for them. <laughs> I started every month bringing them three cartons of cigarettes and three cartons of Jim Beam, and they loved it. And so now I'm learning not only pottery, but now they're taking me to a little place called uh, Erlangen. It was a tone hoser where they made instruments. I love wood. This, it, it was dumpsters of teak and ebony and all these exotic woods, and I could just go in there and get, I, did I send furniture home? I sent home ammo crates full of wood. <laughs> but I learned how to do a little bit there. And then I came back to Johnstown, Pennsylvania, that's where we live. And Johnstown's famous for the flood, you, you know about the flood. Yeah. 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 yeah, 1889 when those rich folks made that place up there and killed all those people. But anyway, Miss Maggie Monahan was teaching classes up in her, in her house. And she's white. And she, she said she would take me on, but she was afraid that I was going to, her words were, I was going to molest the little white girls. Mm. I said, Miss Monahan, I came for one reason. I want to learn pottery. And if that's what, if you can teach me, you won't, I won't even speak to them. Well, they tried to speak to me, but I said, no, stay away. Let me learn this pottery. So I took eight weeks of lessons. In eight weeks of lessons, I didn't do anything but once a week is try to center the clay. I did. I failed. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. She couldn't teach me a, how to do the clay. So that summer, everybody's going to Alfred. Alfred is the mecca of pottery. They could afford to go to Alfred. I couldn't afford it. I looked in Ceramics Monthly, and there was a magazine about pottery, and it said there's a throwing workshop in Ware, New Hampshire. So I, I said, I'm going, where New Hampshire? And my, my wife, who's black, she said, oh, honey, I don't want you to go. Those white people might kill you. I said, I'm going, because I got to learn pottery. I ain't got time to put it with this foolishness. I got to learn. So I went there, and I'm standing on the, uh, at the bus stop with my bag and uh, uh, some tools that I had. And these, the white guy and the black guy came up to me, and they said, who, who are you? And I told them who I was. And what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready to go do some pot. Uh, stop. If you say that, Brown, they're going to take you to jail. So they said, can we take you? Where are you going? I said, I'm going to David Robinson's house. It was up cold. They said, get in the car. They took me there. I learned more in one week than I learned in eight weeks with Miss Monaghan because he was a functional potter. He'd done everything. And I, stayed, I ended up staying, too. Everything that I know how to do today is because of David Robinson. What, and how, how have I learned? I, have, I didn't go to school for it, but I learned from David Robinson. I learned from... Uh, it's big name potters. Jack Troy. I learned from Kevin Crow. I learned from uh, David Shader. I learned from them and then I adapted to me. 
Now, as I was a young child, Granddaddy McDowell, and I find out, we just found out uh, a couple weeks ago, Jan, no, 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 antique, not antique, ancestry.com. Guys don't really care about, you know, I don't know. But Jan said, I said, my family is from Gaffin, South Carolina. When Jan started looking, the McDowells came from Scotland and England. And guess where they started? In North Carolina. So I'm a North Carolinian. I've been that way. I just did not even know. So I found that out. So, so I, I've been learning. And, and one, one more story before I, I stop. Um, I was at it's an adult education class at uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania in Indiana, PA. And it was a little short guy there. His name is David Hovland. And David Hovland's wife was the granddaughter of Alfred Benz, who's the founder of Alfred University. And David, David said, Jim, you are one of the uh, craziest guys I ever met, and you really like pottery. But in order for you to go on, you have to learn things that, that they won't teach you here. And this is David's word. He said, you're going to be the only nigger potter there. <laughs> now, I wasn't offended because he was down with me. But, but he understood our culture. He understood how to talk to me. And he said, here's what you do. You take food, you take wood. OK, wood. Somebody came to the wood farm one day with plywood. <laughs> That's stupid. You got to get wood. So I had a girlfriend at the time who had her father on the sawmill. I had an old truck. I would pick up, I would back up the truck to the sawmill, and they would put down these hardwood blocks to kill dried wood that were coming to go into hickory to do furniture down here. I mean, ain't it funny how I ended up back where I started? And so when I started, I came there to, they were doing an oligama fire. It was a kill from here to that wall. And they were stalled. It was about 1,200 degrees. And they couldn't get it no higher. When that kill dry wood showed up, oh, God, they wanted to kiss me because the temperature just started going. And within five hours, they had cone tin down flat. Cones are things that uh, record the temperature in the kill. And, and when the, uh, four days later, when they opened the kill, they had the most beautiful ash glaze on the pots. And then David did something. He put an ad to paper, and people came and bought the kill out. Before he even got it out, they were buying the pots. He said, he said, I love you. <laughs> I'm keeping you around. So so this, so I'm still doing this, and, and these face jokes that I do now are from Africa. They are part of spirit realm. They are because the witch doctor or the spirit person would honor the ancestors, would remember someone who died, or buried at the doorpost of the lintel of the house for protection. Um, when somebody, uh, April Hines, wrote me a number of years ago, I was on a show called History Detectives, and she said her grandfather was a plumber, and he was digging a foundation and found a face jug in the ground. And somebody from down south took it up north. So I started making face jokes. I heard the story from Granddaddy when I was 15. I was probably 30 when I started making face jokes. I had never seen a face joke before, but it was a white guy in at the school who made a big tall one. And I said, well, his look white, you know. So I said, let me make mine with the big noses and the big lips and the scarification and the different things that the tribal people did. And so I started making face jokes and I started uh, learning about our history, learning about different people in history, the, the jokes downstairs. I mean, when I start to read and start to research, sometimes Jan, who's my wife sitting back there, she said, okay, that's enough, let's go. Because <laughs> I'm angry. I, I am angry, I'm an angry black man. But instead of getting mad and burning something down and blowing somebody and cussing somebody out, I put it in my joke, I put it in my work. Because that's where it needs to be. And so, you know, we, we've, started to, to become notarized. I mean, you know, people like my stuff. I mean, the price, uh, when, when she first met me, if you came to me and said, I like your job, I would give it to you. After, after seeing me do that to me, Judge Jan said, look, wait, stop. We got a mortgage, okay? <laughs> you, can't keep, you can't keep doing that. So the prices went from there, 
to there. And sometimes I'm offended because I've never had any money. Never. You know, and I start to realize, uh, I, I'll give you a good example. 1954, my parents, my dad married uh, Laura, and, and we were living in projects, and my father worked a job at the Pentagon as a guard, and then he got on the bus. Now, the bus was in D.C. You couldn't say that, but soon the bus crossed the line, nigga get in the back. He did that for us. I didn't realize that. He, he ended the Pentagon art show two years in a row and won it. The job that he wanted was at the Naval Research Laboratory, and because he didn't go to the schools that they honored, they said, because you won the show, we're going to hire him. So they bought a house on 26 Channel Street, Washington, D.C., for $12,500. We were the first black family moved in there. They had to borrow money from the realtor to pay the down payment. My mom, my dad died 20 years ago. My mom died this past June, and my dad said, there won't be any money for you. All the money is for your mother. The house now that they paid $12,500, they're worth over a million plus. And we're getting ready to split it. And that, that kind of makes me cry. Because he knew that if he bought this house, he could build some wealth for the family. He could build some wealth. And, and, and through, and I built it a kill. Jan and I did a show, I think it was two years ago. It was in Noy's house up in Connecticut. New, I think New Canaan, Connecticut. Yes, sir. And it was a guy named Alec Noyes who, who built these houses. He's like Frank Lloyd Wright. But this house was big. Black people couldn't do nothing but work there. But anyway, my face drugs were there. They, they said, send us seven face drugs with the writing on them. So Alex, my gallerist in Los Angeles, went in there and the gate, the face jokes were facing front, but the back was to the wall. He said, no, turn that thing around and put them out so the people can see them. Two days later, they saw all the jokes and said, send us 11 more. We made so much money, it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what's going on. We made money and Alex said, what do you want? I said, I want to build a kill. We have spent $18,000 on a kill that I'm going to have on my back. What did the slaves want? They wanted freedom, and they wanted land. I have had freedom. I have land. Now I have some money. I can do something. The ancestors have pushed me, pushed me to do this, pushed me to tell this story, pushed me to be the, the one who stands in front of you. Now, now somebody will say, how can you do this? Oh, God, this is funny. Negro History Week, that a white friend of mine said, why can't y'all decide what you are? You black, you colored, Negro, what are you? Anyway, it was Negro History Week, and I was in the third grade, and, 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 and Miss Williams said, Jimmy, you're going to be Joe Lewis. And here's the soapbox, and there's the auditorium, and she said, you put on this T-shirt and this thing here, and something else I didn't know in my tennis shoes. You're supposed to come out, step on the box, and put your hand up and say, I am Joe Lewis, heavyweight champ of the world. Well, when I put my hand up, the thing that I didn't put on was the jockey strap. The pants fell down in front of 500 people. And they were all laughing. And I just picked it up and kept going. And I ain't had nothing to hide since. <laughs> so I can talk to you. And that's a true story. So I still do things like that. I still talk to people. So my daughter gets so mad. Says, do you know that? I said, no. But I want to know them. <laughs> so I talk to them. I mean, everywhere I go, I, I can't be quiet. I can't be shut down. But, you know, and, and the last thing I'm going to say is people are talking about this critical race theory. I don't talk about it. I live it 24-7. All I want you to do is one thing for me. Just tell the truth. That's all. Just tell what really happened. Don't, don't make a story. You know, somebody in Texas said the slaves, the, no, they weren't slaves. They lined up and signed up to come to America. No, they didn't. They were not indentured. They didn't get paid for nothing that they did. So, that's it for Jim. Jim is here. He's alive. He's well. He's doing what he can, and he's, he's aggravating people. I mean, you know, I, I hope I haven't aggravated the heck out of you, but I want you to know the story. Now, I need some help, because one of the things that I do is I have jug bodies. Here they are. And I want someone...
Now, is there anybody in the room who would like to make a joke? Come on, come on up. She, she got her hand up first, she's the first one there. Come on up here. We're gonna make a joke. I need some, I need some water here, so let's get some water here. Go on that side there. Go on that side there. Get that, get this. Okay, now, in everyone in this room, is a DNA of your culture. Uh, last week, I, oh, not last week, a couple of days ago, I did a, I did a face trip workshop. Which one do you want? This one. That one? Okay, that's, that's your job. Okay. So, first thing you gotta do, so wait, I did a face job and I was telling them that everyone in here came from somewhere and your ancestors inside you. I said, Think for a minute the things that are important to you. Think for a minute the symbols. Think for a minute the things that you like and do that. When she finished her jug, it was a Toby jug with the, with the big nose, with the mustache and funny lips. It was an English jug. So the first thing you want to do is make a line down it. Make a line right there. Yeah, yeah. Now make cross hatches right there. Small, now. small or big? Oh, big, deeper. Make an X. Oh, okay. Make an X. Yeah. Because she's going to put the nose on first. We put the nose on first. And then we paint it. Oh, I forgot to tell you that the jug that you're making, I'm going to glaze it, fire it, and send it to you. It's your jug. Because yeah, yeah. I, I don't like to do something and don't give somebody something. Because you have received, freely you have received, and freely you must give. Okay, now take a piece of clay and make a snake. Like about like this, roll it in, roll it in between your hands like that. Yeah. Oh, that's a big one. I like that. <laughs> that's okay. She's made a black jug. That's okay. Now, that's good right there. Stop. I have a big nose. Yeah, you got a big nose. Okay, that's good. Stop right there. Now, on the back of it, put some X's like you did there. I had yeah. Uh -huh. Make X's all the way down. I had fun with the kids because we put the nose on. Oh, please, please hurry up. They didn't put the holes in. He can't breathe. They were snickering and laughing at me. Now wet it. You gotta put this one here. Wet it this way. Wet it this way. Okay. All right. Now shove it on here. Shove it on there. Okay. Yeah. That's there. Your nose. Okay. Now you have to make all the clay that's there go down flat. But before she does that, I gotta do something. He can't breathe. Hurry up. Oh, thank you. Oh gosh. Yes. Okay. Well, that'll keep it from popping off. <laughs> okay. Now. You do that part, okay? I blend it. Yeah, blend it. Uh huh. You don't. You don't want to see that seam line at all. Now I'm going to do one more thing that I'm turning you loose on your own because we want you to be the creative one, not me. You to be the creative one, okay? The jokes are in museums now. They're in homes. They're in galleries. They're six downstairs, and I love doing it because. I have never found anything that I love more than pottery. You know, somebody said, you should get a real job. This is my real job. You know, and I was telling, I was telling Willa the other day, I can't believe I get paid to play. I get paid to play, and it, it's, it's the most wonderful thing. I love it. Okay, now let's do an eye, and then you're going to be on your own. I'm going to get the eyes like this, put some here, and then everything you do, put texture on the piece, okay? Texture is lines and Thing. And on the back of it, you're going to put uh, your name and dread. You're going to put down, Jim aggravates the heck out of me. I'm so glad when he leaves, you know. So now, put some texture in it. Put eye, eyebrow, mouth, ears. You're on your own. Okay. Okay. I'll, if, anybody got any questions? I have a question for Dave. Yeah. Did any of Dave's pottery flap like he wanted it to and they found it? Yeah. And are they in museum pieces? Or? Yes, yes. In fact, a lady in Black Mountain has four of his jokes. And I got this, I got the handle. You know, I got, and I, thank you for that question. I got something else to tell you guys that I didn't, I didn't say anything about. Controversy about Dave's leg being cut off. Anybody heard that? Okay. Uh, Leonard Todd wrote a book called Carolina Clay. I read it about oh, four or five years ago. And it said that Dave got drunk one night 
and he fell across the railroad track and his leg was cut off. Well, I, I looked at that and I, I said, oh, that's, that's not right, that's not right. Because when you cut a leg off, you have less than three minutes to stop the blood or you're gonna bleed out. So I thought about Dave. I thought about his family being, leave, uh, being taken away. I thought about how hard his life was. And I said, no, you cut his leg off to keep him from running because he was going to run. His poetry, the things that he was feeling and saying was pointing to that. They cut his leg off. Now, do I have any validation? Not exactly, but they have found uh, where the field is where the slaves are buried and they're doing ground radar now. Mm -hmm. They're going to find Dave. Mm -hmm. They're going to find him. And boy, will I be happy about that. Because now, the archaeologists and the people that record this stuff, they believe in what I believe. That you cut his leg off on purpose. Mm -hmm. To keep him from running. To keep him at the wheel. Mm -hmm. And so, you know. But, you know, it's just like the thing about the face jugs. The, the, the slaves were making face jugs when they were at the plantation. They were making it after work, and they would slip them in the kill. But when slavery was over, no more kill, no more clay, no more wood, no more nothing. You're out. What am I? I am the bridge between them and now. My responsibility is to always to honor them and to know that I stand on the shoulders of those who were mistreated, mis everything was done. While I was building the kill with the most sweetest white man I've ever met, his name is George Rowland. He's a, his wife owns a Village Potters down in Asheville. George does everything that I and our people were not allowed to do. Plumbing, electrical, bricklaying, woodworking, everything that I was not allowed to be in a, a union, I was not allowed to be in a tradesman, he can do. And the last major job we had, we had to, the arch was being built. And we covered it with two layers of, of tin foil and two layers of, of fiber. And now we have to make the granola mix. So it's like cement and granola. Who's making the granola, granola mix? I am. I'm down here making it. George is waiting for me up there. And right, right then, I understood how the slaves were treated. My back was hurting. I had to go to the bathroom. I was hungry. I had to keep doing it. I couldn't stop because he's waiting for me up there. He never said the bad words or nothing like that. He never said a word, but I had to keep going. And right then I understood intrinsically what I and my people have gone through. And I'll be damned if I'm not gonna teach this lesson. Show these lessons, white, black, green, I don't care. You're gonna learn this lesson. The kids, when I go with the kids, they just love me because they think I'm a kid too. Mm -hmm. We're in there having fun and stuff, but, but you know, but they're learning. They have never been exposed to a black man who can talk and can be conductive and, and can conduct himself. They've never been around that, but that's my job. And that's what I do. And any, any more questions? Not yeah. a question, but just to answer you a little bit more. If you go online to the Southern Pottery, yeah. Southern Folk Pottery Collector Society here in North Carolina, it's in Bennettsville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. If you go to YouTube and search that, there are lots and lots of videos about Dave Drake's pottery. Dave Drake's pottery, yeah. They, they sell at auction still mm -hmm. today. Yeah. And they're, yeah. of course, you, my dream would be one day to go in some antique shop and to find <laughs> one and for them not to know what it is. <laughs> But about 20 years ago, an antique road show, yeah. this lady yeah. had one. Remember that? Yeah. And, and she came and she, how much did you pay? She said $5. Yeah. And he yeah. said, sit down. You told her all about it. What, $50,000 then? Oh, yeah, $50,000 for a jug you paid $5 for. Uh, I was doing a show in uh, Delaware, the Winterthur Museum. And they just had had a show of Dave work. And I begged them, please, please, please. They said, okay, come in, put the gloves on, sit down. I got to handle two of his pots. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there are two. There's some in the in the museum yeah. in Bennettsville yeah. that, that are there that are part of the permanent collection. Yeah, they're huge. And it's very, yeah, they're huge. It's they're just huge. very interesting to go online and there yeah. are lots of YouTube videos yeah. so you can search would, that. If you would explain for the kiln firing, yeah. you're getting a new one. 
Is it going to be wood, gas, or electric? It's gas and and and, and, and wood. Okay. So gas what have wood. you been firing? In? Yeah. Huh? What have you been firing? What, what yeah. kind? Yeah. Have you been using? No, I, no. It's just been built. I got two little doors to put on. It's a guy in England named Joe Finch who designed this kill. So we interpreted the kill, and we're going to use. Gas. I live in a residential neighborhood, oh, so okay. 20 foot flames would not <laughs> be to be in, in free, right? So, so because I, I always tell Jan, I'd rather ask forgiveness than ask permission. <laughs> so the gas company hooked me up, so that means I, I'm okay. But the flames can only get out, you know, can't go too high. So as soon as we get back, and George, George had jury duty this week, so he'll be done with it, so it'll be done. And I'm gonna I'm gonna start firing because where have you uh, been firing before? Huh? Where have you had a kiln before? Never. Well, how are you firing your? I'm firing. I'm a gypsy potter. Okay. I, you know, I gotta be the one who brings the wood and brings the food and and works the shifts no one else would. I've been a gypsy. I've always had electric kilns, but never a gas and never a wood okay. kiln. We couldn't afford it. I mean, when that money started rolling in, I said, oh my gosh, my eyes got big. I said, oh, well, I, we were going to buy some land and put the kill there. But people can be mean. So suppose I, bought, suppose I put $30,000 in a kill that's not where I don't live, someone will go mess it up. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't do that. So I had to have it in my backyard. And boy, did I, was I happy to have, that I had the room to do it back there. Because when we came down here from Pennsylvania about 12 years ago, oh, 10 years ago, she's telling me, uh, we were looking in Asheville. We couldn't afford Asheville. And I said, well, where do black people live at? And they said, well, well there was a few in Weaverville. <laughs> so I came to Weaverville. I talked to a potter down there. And he said, oh, we welcome you, the white guy. So I, we found this house. And I said, this is where we're going to be. Not knowing that the ancestors planned this. I'm from North Carolina. I'm from here. My roots are I'm an Appalachian as there ever could be. You know? So, you know, and what that makes me happy because when you're God, I mean, no, I'm a Christian, okay? I believe in Jesus and I've talked to Jesus all the time. Thank you, Jesus, for this job. Thank you, Jesus, for Jan. Thank you. You know, but when, when you deal with the ancestors, they come to you in dreams. They come to you. I wake up in something. I remember one time I woke up, I said, oh, they told me to start doing wings on the jugs. Because when slaves would disappear, they say, where'd they go? They said, Jesus gave them wings and they flew away. <laughs> they, that, that's, that's what they believe. I started, uh, I, I, I woke up one time and I was, oh. I, I took art class. I took art class and we were walking in the museum one time and somebody said, that's just a cloth. No, it's not. When you look at this, you look at the shapes, the shadows, the side, the movement, and everything is in that. That's what art will teach you how to define what you have to see. And, and the kids, and I learned from children. About two years ago, Anthony Davis plays for the Los Angeles Lakers. You guys know him? He's a black player. But he has what they call a unibrow. It starts here and goes all the way across. It, it, there's no interruption. So I started doing a unibrow. I started thinking of all the things that uh, black people have endured, black people have started, black people. You know, one of the jokes down there say, is Rodney King. And Rodney said, can't we just get along? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and the poor boy that gave him so much money killed himself. You know, he drank himself to death. Mm -hmm. But I start thinking about it, and I stop being angry so much, but I do some anger to go. Let me see how this jug is doing. I need to know what else to do. What did you need to do is put an ear on it. Put two oh, ears in your duck. Look at this jug. Oh, oh. Raise your hand, Jen. Give Jen your address and everything. 